Hi everybody, Physics Ninja here. Today we're going to look at how do you use Ampere's law in order to find the magnitude and direction of the magnetic field produced by an infinite current sheet. So we're going to assume that we have this green kind of two-dimensional uh, piece of metal and it's carrying a current. And in this case it's flowing in the positive x direction. Uh, there's a current density that I've defined using the letter K, and that's really the amount of current you have per unit of length of width of that particular current sheet. So the question is, how do you apply Ampere's law to find the magnetic field produced by this sheet? Uh, this is kind of a similar problem to finding the electric field produced by a 2D sheet using Gauss's law. It's kind of similar, but I, clearly there are some differences because we're looking at magnetic field. So I'm going to first do it the easy way using Ampere's law, which is written here. And then I'm also going to do it uh, solving... Well, we know the magnetic field produced by one individual wire, right? That, that kind of is a well-known result. What happens if now we place a whole bunch of wires next to each other and then we add up all of their contributions? So you can also do it kind of, it's a slightly more complicated way, but I just want to illustrate the steps and it's really only a few lines of algebra. So let's go ahead and do this problem. If, again, if you have any questions, just leave them in the comments section. I'll try to get back to you as quickly as possible. All right, let's look at first the direction of the magnetic field and let's look at the direction of the field for example, at a point that's slightly above this 2D plane versus a point that's slightly below the 2D plane. And let's look at different contributors to the magnetic field. Well, again, this 2D infinite sheet is really composed of a whole bunch of small wires. So let's consider the wire that's strictly below that point or above this point. All right? one thing you should know is that the field produced by any little bit of current here that's coming out will produce a magnetic field that is a circle Right? It's in a circular direction. So what does that mean? That means that at the top here, the magnetic field produced by this little bit of current coming out of the page points in this direction, and the one at the bottom here should point over here to the right. So let's kind of delete that and just redraw it nicely. So we have the magnetic field contribution just from the segment that's right here below that point should produce fields in this direction. All right, now we have to add other contributions because we don't just have a simple wire here. We have a whole bunch of wires that are adjacent to each other. So let's consider the contribution from this particular wire here coming out of the plane. Again, remember it forms a circle, right? However, at this particular point, that circle here should probably look something like this maybe, right? And that would be the magnetic field produced by this particular segment of wire. Now there's another one we can look at. We can look at one, for example, this one here was shifted over by three units. Let's look at this one here that's shifted over by three units. Again, the magnetic field at a point above should look like this. The magnetic field produced by the point below should look like this, right? Remember, you're just simply drawing a circle and you're drawing a line that's tangent to that circle. Now I forgot to draw the purple one here down below, so I can go ahead and do that one. So really we have different contributions to the magnetic field. However, I just want to look at the direction now. One thing you notice is that the blue one here is pointing simply to the left at the top and it's pointing to the right for the bottom. I want you to notice about the red and the purple lines, right? The red is produced by a point over here on the left and the purple one is produced by this point down over here on the right. Right? If you consider their, uh, if you were going to add both of these as vectors, what you would end up getting would be a total magnetic field, right? The vertical components would cancel out, right? And what you're left with is simply a total magnetic field that is pointing to the left at the top of the plane. And what you would get is a total magnetic field that is pointing to the right. And it doesn't matter which wires you consider because we're dealing with an infinite sheet here. So every time you deal with a wire on one side, there's an equal wire on the other side. And again, those vertical components of the fields are always going to cancel. Okay, so at the end of the day, what we're left with here is a magnetic field that is pointing to the right below the plane and a magnetic field that is pointing to the left above the plane. So we already know the direction of the field. It means there can't be any component pointing up or down produced by an infinite sheet. That there does not make sense, okay? Because you always have a wire on one side and one on the other side because it's 2D and it's infinite.
The next step now is going to apply Ampere's law to this problem. Ampere's law, we're gonna split it up into a left-hand side, which is this integral, and then we'll do the right-hand side. So let's first look at the uh, left-hand side over here. So we have to integrate over a closed loop. That's what this integral means. So let's draw a closed loop for this problem. Um, doesn't matter kind of how big it is, but we're gonna draw it symmetrically around this 2D infinite sheet that has its current coming out of the page. All right, so here's my uh, my closed loop. And now what I really want to do is pick a direction. I'm going to integrate in this direction over here. So that here defines the vectors DL for each one of those segments. And really we're going to identify these segments. One, two, three, and four. Now one thing I already know is that uh, the magnetic field anywhere at the top has to point in this direction, right? And the magnetic field anywhere at the bottom or below this 2D infinite sheet has to point to the right. And that means if you have a look at segments two and four, right, that means the magnetic field, again, anywhere at the bottom is gonna point in this direction, anywhere at the top is going to point in the opposite direction over here. So actually with respect to the wire, the magnetic field is always perpendicular to the wire. And that's important for uh, the left-hand side of Ampere's law. So let's go ahead and write that down. So this is really what we want to evaluate. And what I've done here is I've broken it down into four segments, right? So I really want to integrate over B dot DL over segment one. To that, I want to integrate over segment two, right? You have to integrate over the entire closed loop and B dot DL of segment four. And again, all those are vectors and that's kind of important. So let's go ahead and fill that in. Now, there's some simplifications, again, because DL and the magnetic field are going to be perpendicular for segments two and four, that means that you don't have to worry about those, right? Because that scalar product between the field and the vector DL is equal to zero because the angle is 90 degrees. So that is equal to zero and that is equal to zero. That means now we're left with only two terms to worry about. We have the integration of BN DL over the top segment and we have B and DL over the bottom segment. Now, one thing to notice here is that here I've drawn this a certain distance X away. Well, actually, that's Z away. Let's use the same notation here. And this here I've also drawn to be symmetric, so it's also Z away. Uh, what else? Uh, this entire length here of this loop, let's call that L, uppercase L like this. All right, now let's evaluate this integral over here. So B dot DL, well, again, all you have to do now is that B is going to have a particular magnitude here. So I'm simply going to write that as B. Z here has a particular magnitude um, dot DL. Uh, DL now is going to be a vector and B is going to be constant, right? There's no need for B to vary anywhere along this length because it is a 2D infinite sheet. So this integral over here simply comes uh, BL and cos of the angle theta. The angle theta for the top is cos of zero degrees, so that's a simplification. How about at the bottom now? At the bottom, again, we're going to have, uh, it looks like a similar term, right? It's the magnitude of the vector b, it's the magnitude of the vector dl integrated over this entire length, and cos of the angle theta again. It's cos of zero degrees. So actually what you're left with here is simply two, the magnitude of B, which may be a function of Z, we'll see in a minute that it's not, uh, but this here is the closed loop integral of B dot DL. All right, so we've done already most of the work. All we have to do now is evaluate what is the right-hand side now of Ampere's law and then put it all together. So the right-hand side of Ampere's law is pretty simple. It says how much current is actually enclosed by this loop? Well, for that, you have to use the fact that we know the current density, right? Our current density was how many amps we had per unit length of this loop. Well, this, this loop here has a length L, which means that this term over here, let's go evaluate it down here at the bottom. This is the right-hand side. So we have that mu zero multiplied by the current enclosed is going to be mu zero and the current enclosed is going to be my current density K multiplied by the length, right? This here, the term in the bracket here is actually the current enclosed by this loop. So make sure you understand this term. 
And those have to be equal to each other. That's Ampere's law. So we go ahead now and let's make it in red over here. So what we have here is two multiplied by the field multiplied by the length is equal to mu zero, our current density K multiplied by the length as well. Notice we have the length here on both sides. So it actually doesn't really depend on the properties of the loop that I picked. And now at the end, all you have to do is isolate. And what you're left with here is that the magnitude of the field is going to be a constant value. It doesn't depend on the letter Z. Okay, it's equal to mu zero, our current density, and divided by two. All right, so there you have it, folks. There it is, the magnetic field. And that is simply the magnitude. Now, we could simply get rid of this Z dependence here. We don't really have to worry about that. Let me clean that up a little bit. So there's the magnitude of the field. And again, we already know the direction. The direction you can find from the right-hand rule or using the arguments I did a few minutes ago. All right, I now want to use the fact that I know the field produced by a single wire, right? If I just draw one particular wire over here and I have a current flowing upward like this, again, you know the magnetic field produces circles around that wire. And now if I am a certain distance away from this wire, let's call it R, uh, you should know that the magnitude of the field, uh, the magnitude of the field should be written as this, mu zero multiplied by that current and divided by two pi r. All right, that result I know. So let's think about this 2D infinite sheet as composed of a whole bunch of little wires going in one direction. And all you wanna do now is add up their contributions. You'll have to integrate, so there is a little bit of calculus involved, but if I integrate or I add up all of their contribution, I should get to the same result as I did using Ampere's law. It's mathematically a little bit more complicated, but it's a good kind of exercise to go through at least once in your life. All right, let me show you the steps. All right, so again, uh, this is the setup now. I really have a 2D infinite sheet. All I could do is color that in. Again, and all of those currents are coming out of the page. Let's consider one of these little currents over here. It's, again, it's, it's long, it's coming in and out of the page like this, and it's a certain distance away from the point. The point that I'm evaluating is going to be just right here, and it's a certain distance away from the 2D infinite sheet, and it's a certain distance from this small amount of current. Now, the amount of current, if I consider just a little bit of length over here, dx, and there's a current density k, that means the amount of current here between both of those lines is k dx. Now, what I wanna do now is consider the field produced by this little bit of current all the way over here at that point. So again, we're looking at a certain distance, right? If you draw the distance r from that current all the way to that point, that's what it looks like, and this is the value r. If you think about the direction now of the magnetic field produced by this little bit of current, again, you should find a vector that is coming in this direction over here. Again, what we're going to be interested in here is only the component of that field that is actually pointing to the left if we're looking at a point above it. Because again, there's always going to be a wire on the other side that's going to cancel the vertical components. All right, so we're just about done now setting it up. So we have our little bit of field that we want to evaluate, and that's going to be equal. I'm using the result of the wire now. It's going to be equal to mu zero. Now, how much current am I looking at? I'm looking at just the current inside this little bit of box here. So that current is simply K multiplied by the length that I'm considering, dx. All right, and now all I wanna do is I only wanna take a particular component of that field, and I'm only considering the component of the field that is pointing to the left, so then I'm gonna have cos of the angle theta here. All right, what else do we have? Well, if I use the result from the wire, I have to divide by two pi, and I have to divide by this distance r. I'll just keep it as r like this. Now what makes this integral a little bit more complicated here is that you have the value x, you have the value theta, and you have the value r, which are all kind of connected to each other. So one thing to notice from this triangle here, we're gonna kind of get rid of dx. And if this is the angle theta, you should be able to convince yourself that this here is also the angle theta. All right, so what do we have left now? 
Well, we can use some trig functions over here. Let's define a few things here. If this is the angle theta and I'm looking at this triangle over here, you should be able to say that cos of the angle theta is going to be equal to A over R. And what else? We can also write an expression for sine of the angle theta. Right? We also have sine of the angle theta is going to be equal to X over R. And if you combine both of those, we should be able to write that tangent of the angle theta. Let's just write it down here. Tangent of the angle theta is simply sine divided by cos. And if you do that here, you're gonna have X over A. And the reason I want this expression over here is because, again, if you isolate over here, we're gonna have X equals A tangent of theta. Now we're gonna simplify this expression over here. What I wanna do is get rid of DX. However, I do have an expression over here and I can use this in order to find an expression for DX and that I'll let you do by yourself, but you should obtain here that DX, again, you simply differentiate with respect to theta and A is a constant for this particular problem and what you end up getting is A cosine squared of theta D theta. All right, now we're gonna go back to our expression over here for the little bit of element of field. Here we get mu zero. We're going to have K. And instead of DX here, I'm gonna substitute with my expression over here. So this is A divided by cos squared theta. This is still D theta, uh, cos of the angle theta. And now over here, I'm left with two pi and divided by R. And look at R over here. R I can also use one of my expressions over here, right? R I can write as A divided by cos theta. Let me go ahead and do that. That's A divided by cos theta. <laughs> now there's a whole bunch of cos thetas everywhere in this expression. And there's A's at different spots. So actually I can get rid of the A's. Those are easy to cancel out. I can use this cos theta to get rid of one of those. And actually, if you look at this expression over here, you should convince yourself that this here is also going to get eliminated over here. Started out to be a really complicated expression here. It simplifies nicely. So what we're left with here is mu zero, k. These are all the constant terms, two pi. And we have this little element of angle d theta. And again, don't worry about the direction. The direction we know is in the negative y direction, right? So let me just write that. Write it out like this. So what you have to do now is integrate over all of the angles, the possible angles. Well, again, if that element is really, really far away, it would kind of look like this. And if it's really far away on the other side, it would look like this. So really the angle goes anywhere from pi over two all the way to negative pi over two. So let's go ahead and integrate both sides. That gives us the total field. The total field at this point is going to be mu zero k divided by two pi. And now I have to integrate all the way from minus pi over two to pi over two d theta. And again, the direction we know. So this integral, again, this is a simple integral here. So we get mu zero k, two pi. And this simply becomes theta evaluated between those limits over here, which actually just simplifies to the angle pi. All right, cancel out the things that are common to everything, get rid of those pies. And what you're left with, lo and behold, we get pretty much the exact same answer as we had in the previous case. All right, if you have a look at this expression over here, uh, let me simplify this, let's get rid of these pies. And let's move that over a little bit. This was in the negative y direction. That is the total field at this particular point that I'm evaluating it at. And again, it's independent of the distance from that 2D plane, and that's because the sheet is infinite. All right, and we get the same expression as we had using Ampere's law. A little bit more complicated, but not so bad in this case. All right, thanks for watching, folks.